In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace and peace of God our Father, the love of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. In the waters of baptism, your dear husband and Father John died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory. Let us pray. Eternal and loving God, you made the union of man and woman a sign of the bond between Christ and the church. Grant peace and mercy to John, who was united in love with his wife, Patty. May the care and devotion of his life here on earth find a lasting reward in heaven. Look kindly on Patty and the children as they turn to your compassion and love, strengthen their faith, and lighten their loss. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Please be seated for our readings from Sacred Scripture. <coughs> A reading from the book of Revelation. I, John, heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, said the spirit, let them find rest from their labors, for their works accompany them. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. 
In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The Gospel of the Lord. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you besides. If we're honest, every one of us is worried about something. If we're honest, we're anxious about things that really, at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, will not matter at all. But if we seek his righteousness, if we seek his kingdom with all of our being, God will provide. God has provided. And in a very special way today, we come to celebrate at this altar a man who sought the righteousness of God, a man who sought what was truly important, who treasured the treasure of his life and lived with all of his being reflecting that. You, Patty, Barb, Michael, and everyone else around you were the treasure of his life. Nothing, nothing could come in the way. And his righteousness was often given to you in the lessons of life, in the lessons of marriage. Although, Patty, I have to say, when you shared with me why you married John, unsolicited, uh, actually, it was a checklist. He was smart, he was honest, and the list kept going on. Never anything about he was good looking, nothing about that. It was merely at first an intellectual love affair that started. And that is intimidating to sit in front of such well-educated people, but the only thing we have to talk about today that we share a very common ground that your husband and father and grandfather lived was the truth. You said over and over again, personally, professionally, and in his spiritual life that he obviously did not wear on his sleeve, he was an honest man, a man of righteousness, a man of integrity, a man of honesty. And that's why even though there's a real sting to his death, today we're able to come to celebrate because that's what we do. If we're honest, if we're truthful, we come before the Lord to give thanks to God and celebrate John's life, his family life, his marriage, his professional life. But we celebrate a man who truly did run the race not just the race of the streets, 
my encounters with John Rittinger were always on the street, always running, and I'd say hello and he'd just keep running. <laughs> I was intimidated at first, again, because I realized, with all due respect, there was no small talk with your dad. <laughs> and you knew very, very quickly where you stood, but more, more quickly than that, you knew where his family stood. You were everything to him. And this man who on the surface looked so serious and so stern was yet the biggest joker going. The pictures reflect that. Your memories reflect that. And they will continue to reflect that. Today for us in faith reminds us that he's not dead, he's not passed away, he's not gone. He's fully alive, alive in the embrace of Christ risen from the dead, alive in paradise, alive in the fulfillment of the promise of a life well lived. It said at those beautiful words of the, Paul, the letter of Paul to Timothy that I'm already being poured out. He poured out his whole life for you. He poured out everything for you. And now he enjoys the true treasure of a life of giving a life of sacrifice, a life lived for others. You know, it said he fought the good fight, fitting for a lawyer, not an attorney. I was trying to fathom those lines for those of you that are attorneys here. Today, you're just a lawyer among lawyers. But today, we celebrate a man who fought for the truth, who fought for his family, who fought for integrity, and with John's death, there's something missing in the world. Because people of integrity, people of truth, people of honesty, people of faith, people of family, people that treasure what's truly important in life are hard to come by. But today we celebrate a man who gave us a family. And you will continue that legacy. You'll continue to live that honesty, integrity, that truth, that good humor, that fun and games behind a stiff and stern face at times, the man who ran so as to win, the man who lived life to the fullest, not just a cliche that we use at a funeral, but he truly did. Patty, when you recalled the day before he died, it was, uh, there was a part of sadness, but to be very honest with you, there was a, an envious part of all that he did in just one day. In one day, he was able to enjoy the gift of retirement, enjoy your presence, enjoy life, life to the fullest. And I do have to say, since you shared so much about your life, starting at St. Bonnie's, at Notre Dame, your love affair that spanned in five decades, I have to admit, you must have had some of the most extraordinary conversations, but some of the oddest conversations as well. <laughs> Patty shared with me that John and her last conversation, I think the kids called it fight, but we'll call it a conversation since we're in church, was do the words either or and and mean the same thing? That has perplexed me for the last 48 hours. <laughs> and really, that was your last conversation. Today, today in the midst of the sting of death, because of love, because of faith, we're able to laugh. But tears will still come. And when the tears come, you must remember the stories behind every, every memory of his life. Never get tired of those stories, and especially you, the grandchildren. If your parents or your grandmother says, let me tell you this story, and you say, oh, I've heard this before, don't do that. Because those stories will keep him alive in your heart. Because our faith tells us he is alive. Alive in the embrace of Christ, risen from the dead 
alive in eternity. And he will watch over you. His love will still be there. His love will be there when you need it most and when you least expect it. His love and guidance and all those things that he taught you, that you wanted to learn, and let's be honest, that you didn't want to learn, will be reminded in the moments in the years ahead. Treasure those. And I often say, and believe with all my heart, you have to be good, because now he sees everything you do. And I'm not worried about the grandchildren, Mike or Barbara. I'm worried most about you, Patty. He sees everything you do. Seek first his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. John Rittinger in his life gave many, many lessons. Life lessons, family lessons, law lessons, lessons of the school of hard knocks, and lessons that will never, ever leave you. But I believe the greatest lesson that many of us witness today is that he treasured his family, treasured his friends, treasured his faith. And that's such a lesson for us to learn, that when death comes so quickly for someone so full of life, we have to learn to treasure what's important and value and give renewed value to the treasures of our lives. We celebrate a man who did that unto his last breath. And we, because we've gathered here today to celebrate in faith and thanksgiving, but also to celebrate a man's legacy, we must take something. The only way you can have a legacy and hand it on is that we take something from it. Do we treasure the gift of our family and friends enough? Have we held back on doing anything that we've not wanted to do? Have we not reached out to a family or friend? Is there something still on that bucket list waiting for us to do? A part of celebrating John Rittinger's legacy is to go and do it. Run so as to win. Fight the good fight. Never give up. Today, we gather at this altar. And at this altar, we are a people of thanksgiving, but we are also a people nourished with the gift of hope, nourished with a Savior who never abandons us. And we are nourished by the same Savior who came the other day and said, John, come to me. And it's very important that you know, remember, and value this in faith. He was not alone. Jesus was there. And Jesus said, John, come. And he took him by the hand and took him home. He took his soul into the joy that he promised him. So for today, we celebrate. Amidst the tears, we're able to, cr we're able to laugh. Amidst the laughter, we still find the sting of missing him. And that will be our human condition until until we are all in the embrace of Christ, where John will greet us at the door of paradise, where he will welcome us. It won't be this big, gregarious welcome, but it will be John Rittinger, and it will be his love for you and for everyone. Let us today, in his legacy, truly seek the things that are important, the truth that sets us free, righteousness and integrity, and truly to be people that treasure family and friends. Run so as to win. Fight the good fight, and not for the crown of this life, but for the crown that he now wears in the glory of heaven.
My dear friends, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father, where he intercedes for all of us who are his children, with confidence that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we join our prayers now to his. For John, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that he may now be admitted to the company of the saints, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For our brother, who ate the body of Christ, the bread of life, that he may now be raised on the last day, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For our deceased relative and friends and for all who have helped us, that they be now rewarded for their goodness, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For those who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the family and friends of our brother, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord, who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all assembled here to have here to worship in faith, that we may be gathered together again in God's kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all who serve in law enforcement and the armed services, that the Lord will bless and protect them as they protect us, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and the voices of all your people whose prayers we offer through Christ our Lord. Please be seated for the presentation of the gifts. Injury, 
the Almighty Father, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your faithful and loving servant, John, we beseech your mercy that he who did not doubt your son to be a loving savior may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the host and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord. Till you come. 
Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Nelson, our Bishop, and all the clergy and religious. Remember your servant John, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. And all who have died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. My friends, at the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace, I leave you, my peace, I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. God of loving kindness, listen favorably to our prayers. Strengthen our belief that your Son, Jesus Christ, has risen from the dead, and our hope that your servant John will also rise again through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you all for coming. For someone who practiced social distancing before it was the thing to do, John certainly has a big crowd. The wonderful reflections on, of John has confirmed all of the reasons I fell in love with him and married him when I was 21, and as I always pointed out, he was 22. As Father has said, the first thing that attracted me to John was that he was intelligent, but also I will throw in good looking. <laughs> and if you look at my grandchildren, that was an important thing. He was loyal and he was honest. And it's, it's nice that I always thought that, but so did everybody else. The reason I am speaking is because after I gave eulogies at a number of funerals, John said he wanted me to speak at his. And this is the last time I can do what he has asked. There were many times I didn't do what he's asked. <laughs> My grandfather, Dunleavy, always said, prayed every night that he wanted a happy death. And when I asked him what that meant, he said, I want to die quickly. He said, it's going to be harder than everyone else, but it will be good for me. John also wanted a happy death and he got what he wanted. He died after a fun-filled day. He walked that morning uh, 
the morning before he died, he walked to get the newspaper where he brought it and laid it on the bed next to me so when I woke up, I could read it. He played 18 holes of golf. His golfing partner says for somehow that the golf scorecard has gotten misplaced, but he's sure it said uh, that he, John got a par. And if not, he's keeping to that story. <laughs> John also bought the last round. And it was, I don't know, I think it was $11, which was, I don't, I don't buy last rounds, I don't drink, but it was supposedly a pretty good price. He came home, he swam. I looked out and saw him sitting at a chair reading at the pool facing the gulf. That night he asked for a back rub, which I don't give often, but that, that night I did. And the most important thing he found before he went to bed, that the Yankees had lost. <laughs> to him, this was a perfect day. <laughs> he was blessed. I asked our grandchildren to write a sentence about John and these are some of the ones that I got. He always took me to 7-Eleven and bought me a Slurpee. He would take me to the creek and we would explore. He taught me how to ride a bike, but first I had to watch the YouTube, the kids had to watch the YouTube to see how you take off the pedals and you learn how to balance on the bus route and then you put the pedals back on and off you go. He would wear his dinosaur head and his duck call and use it at appropriate times, like when he dropped the kids off at school. Or, uh, but he, as I told the kids, you know, he tried hard to embarrass them, and they said he, he succeeded. He showed the kids how to fish. One, one of the grandchildren said, he pulled me around the lake on the boat on a tube. And then another said, he loved seeing the bears and the moose, although he called it meese for plural, at Yellowstone and Grand Teton. And he ex really enjoyed the time that Michael and his two girls, the older girls, toured the aircraft carrier at Charleston. He was a perfect, imperfect man. He will be missed, and I will love him forever. I am Michael Rittinger, John's son. Thank you all for coming today. My dad told me that he was lucky to have kids when he was so young, so he had the opportunity to grow up with them. As my mother can attest, there was often a debate as who was growing up faster, Barbara and me on the one hand or my dad on the other. We were lucky. My uncle Jerry and Aunt June worked for the Buffalo Bills, and we attended a lot of games. When they were promoted, our seats were upgraded to the luxury box. This was great because it's super cold up there. So I met my dad at the box and he like ran over to me and exclaimed, they have an open bar here with five types of vodka. We're doing a Pepsi challenge to see if we can tell the difference. <laughs> I told him that I had a study the next day and his response was fine, we'll only do three. Now get something to write on and pour them with my back turned. In addition to the Bills games and Bonaventure basketball games, my father, his friend Jack Herrick, and I fished all over upstate New York. We fished Cayuga, Seneca, St. Lawrence, Gananaqua, East, West Branch of the Delaware, Skenny Atlas, and Lake George. This involved a lot of travel. My father had a unique and inappropriate method to calculate travel time and distance. Dad, how far is only in New York? Michael, it's two beers. <laughs> Syracuse was one beer, Poughkeepsie was three beer, beers. Uh, New High Park, Long Island was five beers. If you look at the map, it should have been four beers, but this is where his in-laws lived. When I was around my twin's age, I remember my mom was driving us to Poughkeepsie and I gave him another beer and told him to drink faster because I wanted to get to my grandmother's house quicker. As my mother was a high school math teacher, she was out the door early and my father was responsible for getting us to school. I guess you can say that this made my sister and me self-sufficient. He wasn't gonna be late to work. And we drove in with one of his law firm partners, Sandy Tannenhaus, every day. 
which was great because they would quiz us on history, current events, religion, politics. The real treat, however, was they would try to embarrass Barbara each morning after they dropped her off. They would use duck calls uh, when she was walking up to meet her classmates. Uh, they would both get out of the car wearing Gracho Mark glasses. They also had Darth Vader masks. And this is before email, so they were coordinating this like at work the day before. As my mother said, he continued this activity with his grandkids when he would pick them up from Cardinal Foley. Now, he did not pressure either Barbara or me into becoming a lawyer. He wanted us to become accountants. I understand that that involves math, so I thought it best to avoid it. He did trial work, and what he described as his bread and butter client was CSEA, which is the New York State Employee Union. He represented employees on work-related issues against the state. Uh, during college, he let me sit in on a couple of the hearings as well as read of all the briefs and other filings. One involved a snowplow driver that was given a breathalyzer test on 6 a.m. Monday morning one summer, and it revealed a level of alcohol less than the illegal limit to operate a motor vehicle. He was terminated based on the state's zero tolerance policy. At the hearing, it was shown that the employee had no prior employment or criminal issues, uh, but he had a barbecue Sunday night at his house the day before where he drank beer. After the hearing on the way back to Binghamton, my dad turns to me and goes, could you imagine if they gave me a breathalyzer at six o'clock on Monday or any attorney in, in Binghamton? There'd be no lawyers left. This man deserves a second chance. And he got it. The employee was reinstated. After law school, I practiced in Ithaca, New York for three years, my Atticus Finch years. Most every judge that I was in front of would comment on my last name. My dad and I actually represented co-defendants in two cases. One was a fraternity hazing case involving Cornell. We both represented individual defendants that were accused of hazing a freshman. Now I can confirm the story that is probably being still told by Cornell's general counsel, that in federal court in Syracuse, New York, in a courtroom filled with lawyers, I was standing up arguing a point against the plaintiff's counsel in front of Judge Sharp, and I began to feel a strong tug on the back of my suit. Apparently, my father had thought I had sufficiently made my point. It was time for me to sit down. My dad said that the true art of being a good lawyer is to know when to sit down. We'll get to see today if I learned that lesson. My dad retired at 62. People were concerned that he would be bored. This was not the case. Other than golfing and attending to his true calling, washing and folding laundry, my father's retirement activities uh, were the following three categories. One, a couple of years ago, I was moving a stack of books that my father gave to me into my closet, and a handwritten note fell out to the floor, on the floor. My wife, Karen, remarked, your father leaves you personal notes in the books that he gives you? That is adorable. I told her she was too quick to start assigning adjectives to my dad's no notes. I did not read this note yet, but I, I knew what it would have to say. No platitudes, all instructional. The first part was what order the books should be read. These particular books involved Central Asia, spanning from the period from Alexander through the years after 9-11. I was instructed to read them chronologically. Note for the Chambers Hiss books that he gave me, I had to read, you know, one chapter in this book and one chapter in this book, and then, you know, it was, it was an ornate uh, way to go through the books. As for the balance of the note, he explains that he changed in pen the name of a British parliament member from the 1800s to the name of a former U.S. Secretary of State because he thought that they had the same misguided positions out in Afghanistan. I will need to retire early so I can catch up on my reading assignments. Second, I received a text from my father to stop over at his house at Ardmore after work. It was September. I showed up and asked what he needed help with. His response was, Michael, you know that Mario, Ravon, uh, Mario Rivera is the best closer of all time. I mean, there is no way he could blow a five-run lead going into the ninth inning, right? Grab a beer. You have to watch this. He would record the Yankee games and then only watch them with glee if they lost. <laughs> Third, he was focused on his grandkids. His love for his grandkids was so gentle and unconditional, Barbara and I thought he must be a different person from the man who told the school nurse in Binghamton that Barb was going to need to tough it out and no, he would not pick her up early for a mere broken finger from school. 
Alex, Kira, Gracie, Reagan, Shannon, Bridget, and Finn. You are better people for knowing him, and we pray that you have a bit of his grit. I cannot conclude without mentioning the most formative experience of his life, my mom, General Patty. You outranked him. They met basically as kids at St. Bonnie's and spent their entire adult lives together. For all his sarcasm and irreverence, she was his anchor. Without her, his life and the life of generations would not be what they are today. He was lucky to call her wife, and we are lucky to call her mom and grandma. In closing, I was fortunate to spend a lot of time with him. I remember, this is a shock, I remember being at an Irish bar with him a couple years ago between basketball games. This may be a surprise to you, but this one time he actually exhausted the conversation regarding Bonnie's basketball and his hatred of the Yankees. We spoke of death. He told me that he had a complete life and was not afraid to, to die. Being a trained inquisitor, I asked him if he had any regrets, knowing that I had a list involving me if he came up short on the question. He said he did. I'm like, well, this could be good. What do you got? Apparently, in addition to his other jobs that were essential to the war effort of making sure that the officers club bar was fully stocked and also arranging for basketball games, my father was the property officer for the province in Vietnam where he was stationed. This means that he was responsible for adjudicating claims by civilians that claimed the U.S. Army caused them property damage. A farmer close to his base came in to see my dad, the captain, or a Vietnamese, Dai Huy, with a claim. My dad, Dai Huy, learned through the use of an interpreter that the farmer's water buffalo was killed by, at least as it pertains to the animal, effective indirect fire the day before. This means that a mortar artillery round took out the water buffalo. Now, it's important to note that this farmer, a water buffalo is analogous to an American tractor, a truck, and they even milk them. It's very important for their farming operation. The Army, being the Army, had specific regulations regarding compensation for property damage payable to civilians. It provides that if the U.S. Army shoots the water buffalo, we'll pay you full price. If the enemy shoots the water buffalo, the U.S. Army does not pay. My dad confirmed that his base had no outgoing rounds in that sector the day before and determined that it was a VC round, probably meant for his base, that must have got the water buffalo. Dai Hui, with the help of the interpreter, explained this legal nuance to the farmer and advised him that he would not be receiving compensation. The farmer's reaction to this determination in, color, in colorful Vietnamese and choice words in English and French was clear without the need of an interpreter. The farmer was removed from the base by the MPs. My dad left the country several weeks later. He told me at the Irish bar, Michael, Leavenworth is a real place, and I really don't want to go there. But all things being equal, I should have got that farmer some money. I hope you found him and got his forgiveness, Dad. We will miss you. My mother, sister, the rest of our family, thank you again. All of you are encouraged and invited to attend uh, after this for adult refreshments and lunch at Pox and Hallow uh, Golf Course, which is only three or four sips of Budweiser away. Thank you. Trusting in God, we have prayed to God, together for John, and now we come to this last farewell. There is sadness in parting, but we take comfort in the hope that one day we shall see him again and enjoy his company. Although we will disperse in sorrow, it is the mercy of God that will gather us together again in the joy of his kingdom. Therefore, let us console one another in the faith of Jesus Christ.
Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother John in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the many blessings which you bestowed upon him in this life, for they are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us now and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant John and help us who remain to comfort one another with the assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and John forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In peace, let us take him now to his place of rest. Yeah. 